forecasts. Uh, the most pessimistic among you at Ajitsan is saying, yes. not a recession, not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, you deal in probabilities and in ranges in your forecast. I'd like to ask you, just to, in, the, in the theme of forecasting, uh, what do you think are the chances, percentage-wise, even though it's not your main scenario, mm -hmm. that we will see a repeat of 1997 with the consumption tax increase, and that, that we will not only slow down, but actually experience a recession. That is, I know that's n none of you are, are predicting that, but if you could sort of give us a, a sense of where the, the outlier is in, in, in your views. Um, we, can, we, we, we went from uh, the far end of the table <laughs> on the way in. Maybe we'll start with the yeah. close end of the table on the, on the way out now. Even though I'm, I don't say pessimistic, but I want to be cautious, but uh, you know, I only put the 20% chance that Japan get back to the uh, recession after the tax hike. That's very minor uh, probability. All right. Well, of course, uh, very similar, uh, 10 to 20 percent, and uh, probably uh, kind of a more weaker economy mm -hmm. become, would become likely when something uh, out, uh, out of control by the government would happen. And the most likely risk factors uh, in this context would be uh, two things. One is, uh, of course, uh, unexpected uh, worsening of overseas economy, especially uh, I'm concerned with, uh, still a little bit with Europe. And another is uh, unexpected sharp rise in energy prices. All right. Yeah, I think um, maybe 10 percent. So um, recession risk is very small. Um, but I think the risk factor includes um, possible no change of policy by the BOJ leading to higher yen, uh, possibly 97, 98, uh, and also the risk of the uh, possible significant slowdown of the Chinese economy. So uh, those two things, if it happens, um, growth rate could be much, much lower than our current expectation. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll, I'll start taking questions now, starting uh, Anthony, please go ahead in a second. Yeah, if, uh, if someone could bring him a mic, or do you want to? Uh, do we have, actually, we have Mike up at the front, so if you come up and just uh, state your name and affiliation before, before your question, as usual. <laughs> I'm not about to forget now. Um, Anthony Rowley, um, Singapore Business Times. Question really for Mr. Shirokawa. I think you said that if present trends continue, we could see a, a secular deficit on the current account by the end of next year. And you said, I think that this could have uh, Im an impact on interest rates and on uh, debt dynamics. Can you just explain a little bit more how that would come about, the mechanics of that, and what the actual impact would be on Japan's external rating, for instance? Um, what kind of impact do you have in mind? And just very quickly, if I could ask the other, everybody, if the yen remains at roughly this, this level, do you think there's any chance that Japanese companies could begin to bring production back on shore again? We've seen that Canon is going to do this. Just, what's the chances of this movement spreading, do you think? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the uh, we, we tend to think that uh, the uh, turn of the current account balance uh, into a deficit on a secular basis is a very symbolic uh, economic uh, phenomenon for the country, uh, which has been running surplus for a long, long time. And the you know, net um, or deficit in current account balance does mean that uh, Japan has to borrow money on net basis uh, from outside. And country, uh, I think meaning that country you know, is becoming a net uh, borrowing country rather than net uh, lending country. And we tend to think that uh, that would push up interest rates mainly because uh, almost by definition, the share of the foreign investors financing Japanese debt uh, you know, should be much, much higher than the current, situa current level. One, of course, hope is that the BOJ is taking care of that, but risk is that if the external balance, uh, you know, getting into a deficit on a structure basis and printing money, um, yen would receive under pressure uh, from money printing and uh, external balance deterioration 
expectation for, for, for the currency may change, and capital may start to outflow. And BOJ's money printing would not necessarily work. So in, in, that, in that sense, you know, the uh, risk premium for JGB is to pick up, and interest rates rises, of course, you know, depending on the, you know, the magnitude, but leading to, of course, as you know, uh, increase in debt services and increase in deficit and, you know, further print of JGBs. And, if, you know, people start to look at uh, 230, 40% of GDP of public debt and a confidence about Japan would start to deteriorate quite massively. Interestingly, I was in uh, Hong Kong and Singapore last week and, um, you know, I, I, I actually, know, you know, um, the was a bit confused by the Asian investors' view about Japan. Even under the situation of picking up the stock prices, uh, many investors uh, asked me about the sustainability of fiscal situation in Japan. Even though not many, you know, have talked about debt dynamics in Japan domestically, uh, many, you know, Asian investors are now worried about the uh, possible. Um, or, you know, very limited impact from the VAT hike on fiscal situation. So, um, you know, we have seen a situation where not many talk about 230% of debt to GDP, but still the Asian clients are looking at that. Uh, on, on, on your second question, maybe you can answer. Yeah, and yeah. if you have anything well, to add on the yeah, first one, actually, please, you know, the, please go ahead. Uh, it is very one. difficult. In our view, yen's depreciation should, in theory, uh, promote more domestic production rather than, um, you know, overseas production. But what we have found is that the overseas production-related profitability improves as well uh, under the yen's depreciation. So theoretically speaking, exports would become more attractive for companies uh, exporters, but in the meantime, if they do have already subsidiaries related overseas operation, that profitability also picks up under yen's depreciation. And there remains a gap in terms of profitability between overseas and domestic uh, in terms of the you know, profit to sales ratio. And there is, a, there is a, uh, some decent gap in terms of that profitability, like 6% outside, 4% inside. And that gap I mean, in absolute terms, would remain. So domestic profitability may pick up for, from four to five, but overseas profitability may pick up from six to seven in our calculation. So uh, we don't know. I think the yen's depreciation is not necessarily that, that helpful for stopping uh, the so-called whoring out. Yeah, uh, regarding the second point, uh, as I stopped, touch, up, touched up on during my explanation, uh, the current level of foreign exchange rate is almost in line with macro fundamentals. So uh, I'm expecting only moderate uh, reversal of the overseas projection, pro production into domestic sides. Um, if uh, three, one of the three things happens, uh, we would see more visible uh, return uh, of production side into Japan. Uh, one is, of course, uh, more depreciation of currency, uh, say 125. Uh, second would be a more dramatic uh, corporate tax rate cut, uh, which would raise uh, expected profitability uh, of the doing business inside Japan. And the third is more clear, uh, kind, of, kind of a reliable energy, long-term energy policy. I think uh, uncertainty about energy policy is creating a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, cautiousness on the side of the business sector. So uh, if government succeeds in removing uh, these concerns, probably that will stimulate uh, the domestic investment by the, by the companies. And regarding the possibility of the fiscal crisis, um, of course, uh, I do not expect uh, any sustained current account deficit, uh, which is different from Mr. Shirakawa, but uh, uh, even if, uh, you know, Mr. Shirakawa is right, I mean, uh, we would have uh, some uh, small sustained uh, current account deficit for some time. I think uh, uh, we need a kind of a visible capital flight from Japan to create a fiscal crisis in Japan, I think. Uh, as you know, uh, Japan's government, de government debt is almost 100% denominated in Japanese yen. 
and uh, so uh, it's not being affected. It would not be affected by the rating change. So uh, I think uh, uh, it is the key. It would be a behavior of domestic uh, people. Uh, so um, if people's uh, behavior or bringing their assets outside Japan would be gradual, uh, we would be the risk of fiscal crisis should be very limited. If suddenly they accelerate uh, their diversification of assets outside Japan, that would create more more tension in JGB market. Even even uh, if BOJ continue to purchase a lot of JGB from the market. Yep. Uh, on the second point that the uh, related to the uh, overseas uh, production, um, we are now hearing that the uh, uh, many companies, I mean large manufacturers, are thinking that current 100 to 105 level of the yen against the US dollar makes the. Uh, 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 operating rate or in production in Japan is rising a little bit and uh, uh, not reducing, but just when the increase of the demand is coming, where do you put the uh, place to produce? Many companies now thinking to sort of more focus on the domestic rather than overseas. That's probably happening already. And, but I don't think that the, uh, the trend of Japanese companies to uh, shift their, their capacity to, uh, to emerging economies where the demand is increasing much faster than developed economy, that trend is probably not changing too much. That means, uh, to some extent, the uh, currency makes the, uh, uh, some behavioral shift of the co corporate. But the more longer term story, I still think that the uh, demographics, energy policy, uh, that's kind of a uh, uh, headwinds for the uh, manufacturing in this country makes the overseas capacity uh, more um, uh, rising faster than the domestic ones. So th that's what I think about the uh, uh, first, I mean, first part of the second question. And on the fiscal side, I don't think the fiscal crisis will come in, in the next couple of years. That's very unlikely. And even the current account turned to deficit in, say, a couple months or years, I still believe this Japan's holding of three trillion US dollar equivalent of the foreign asset makes the people feel, hey, the time is not now yet. And so it takes quite a long time to feel that Japanese domestic people feel we have to, uh, you know, flight our capital to the overseas. But, you know, it's just an issue of the timing. Uh, by 2020, I mean, as you know, the 2020, we have a Olympic Games in Tokyo, so that's a very good target year for the whole Japanese. So I think to, until 2020, society or country as a whole probably can so hold up. But after that, still very scary. That's what I'm, my view is on that. Thank you. Nazari, Panorit News. I would like Mr. Shigawa to elaborate more about what you said that the energy policy and energy prices are the main uh, threat or main risk for the Japanese economy. Do you have some more details, especially what, which is the best uh, price for the oil uh, barrel for Japan? And I have uh, one uh, simple question for any of you. Uh, how, how is the Chinese uh, crisis with Japan is affecting Japanese economy, if any? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, regarding the price of oils, uh, from Japanese viewpoint, uh, simply put, the cheaper the better. <laughs> of course, uh, if it's uh, cheap excessively, of course, that would affect the, the growth rate of uh, uh, resource-producing countries, which would affect our exports. So, of course, uh, any wild uh, fluctuation would not be desirable. But, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, $80 per barrel is much better than 100 110 and uh, uh, usually, you know, 10% rise in uh, energy prices uh, would subtract about uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.66% of Japanese GDP. So uh, it's very, very important. So uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, probably I, I hope uh, oil prices would be stabilizing uh, at around somewhere at least between 100 and 110. Uh, if the oil prices rises above 120 or 130 and, it's, and it stay there, of course, uh, I, I need to think about uh, the growth prospect for Japan for this year. And uh, regarding energy policy, it's a very delicate matter. So uh, it's very difficult to tell what Japan should do. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, uh, we need to get some consensus among people on this. And uh, probably 2014 would be the year in which uh, Japanese people would seek for uh, the the some 
some direction for long-term energy policy. And in that context, I think, uh, of course, uh, many people in, in the market are watching very carefully the result of the election in Tokyo metropolitan area. Thank you very much. Uh, Chinese, China. yeah, China. that's right, China. China. And if, any, if anyone yeah. has a, on what's, yeah. what's happening in China and how it will affect Japan this year. I think the now China is, I mean, uh, the, the policy makers in China is now shifting to the uh, more sort of policy-driven uh, soft landing scenario. And I think that's working quite well so far. And uh, we, many uh, Western uh, people often argue that the China is now near collapse or something, but I think that's not the case, and uh, we think that soft landing is quite possible. But uh, in case something terrible, in more politically speaking, ha something happening, you know, it's very scary for us, as you probably understand. The history always tells that the uh, something happening in the domestic, always the policy, I mean, leaders of the country try to how do you say, uh, mispl uh, how do you say, they, this, uh, uh, they try to focus the uh, issue to the external side. And uh, obviously, uh, as you understand, that the, when some external issue should be raised in from China's perspective, which countries will be a more you know, target, uh, our country is, I think. So uh, that's uh, always a concern for us. Anyone else on China have anything to add? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the we have two economies uh, which have not yet um, tried tried to you know recapitalize banking industry um, after probably experiencing the massive credit and investment boom. Uh, these two economies are China and Europe. Japan's case is ninety seven ninety eight. U.S. case is seven. 2007, 2008. Two economies, in, in, in my view, um, you know, anyway, were forced to react to a banking system instability after the investment booms. But the China and Europe, in my understanding, those two economies also experienced the investment booms, but not yet, uh, you know, have seen any major changes in terms of the banking system policy, Europe is now making some progress, but not necessarily in China in our understanding. So in that sense, we have to be a bit careful. It is kind of risk scenario, it's not kind of base case scenario for us, but we have to be very careful uh, you know, in, in terms of development of China, uh, you know, in the banking system in particular, in, in, in that sense. Thanks very much. Uh, anyone else from the working press? Hi, my name is Eleanor Warnock, and I work for the Wall Street Journal. I wanted to ask something that has a little bit to do with the uh, current account question, which is about Japan's trade balance. And I know today that Japan saw another huge trade deficit in November. I wanted to ask if um, how much of that is actually due to the energy problem, the rising energy imports, and how much of that is due to kind of a structural change in Japan's uh, trade balance. So if you could answer that question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's 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 very difficult to kind of quantify um, and make you know uh, make breakdown uh, of what is happening in trade balance. But uh, the um, two things I would like to point: number one, uh, imports to GDP or imports to domestic demand, uh, which is so-called import penetration, uh, has been on the rise. Uh, on a secular basis. It suggests that uh, even under remaining sluggish exports, Japanese imports tend to increase. And that means uh, probably because of the um, pouring out of production outsourcing, uh, Japanese companies have been forced to import parts and materials kind of thing. This is a structural thing. And second point I'd like to make uh, is that the, in terms of the reaction of prices to the yen's depreciation, um, you know, imports, import prices have been somewhat 
more sensitive to yen's depreciation rather than export prices. But Japanese companies have been doing so, so well in terms of changing their price tags in, in yen terms. So means probably the current, you know, the uh, deterioration of the balance uh, to a large extent rely on change in Japanese trade structure rather than price setting. And maybe Kichikawa-san would have a view on the energy imports. And energy imports have had an impact on imports itself. But in the meantime, I, I tend to feel that structural change uh, seems to be more important. That's why we are expecting current account balance getting into a structural deficit uh, even within 12, 15 months' time. Uh, even under yen's depreciation, mainly because of this structural change in trade. And of course, you know, the energy policy, if it changes, may affect the trade balance on the positive side, but the, in terms of magnitude, uh, may, may not be enough to change the course. So uh, I'm fairly pessimistic in that sense. That this is mainly because of you know, the change in you know, supply chains, trade, trade structure. Thank you. And anyone else have anything well, to yeah. add, contest? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of data, uh, actually, uh, compared with 2010, uh, when Japan had a trade surplus of about 8 trillion yen. Uh, this year, we are likely to have 11, probably, 11 trillion yen trade deficit. So this is about uh, 18, 19 trillion yen deterioration of Japan trade balance. And uh, this 18, 19 trillion yen deterioration of trade balance could be divided probably mostly even, evenly between the energy factor and the non-energy factor. A little bit larger, uh, energy factor is it's a little larger than non-energy non factor. Probably 10 trillion yen would be uh, energy. Uh, eight to nine should be related with non-energy uh, areas. And uh, out of this 10 trillion yen uh, deterioration of energy trade, probably two thirds would be related to prices. One third would be a kind of a uh, more real change uh, related to the composition of source of energy after the earthquake in 2011. This is a kind of rough uh, kind of a description of how Japan's trade balance deteriorated over the past three years. Um, Regarding the near-term prospect for Japan's trade and current account uh, balance, uh, yeah, I need to admit that uh, uh, imports are growing faster than I originally expected, yeah, honestly speaking. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's possible for Japan to continue to have current account deficit until uh, probably third quarter of this year, uh, in my view. Uh, because uh, if we look at current account or trade balance from uh, a viewpoint of balance between investment and saving, I think uh, this year, uh, corporate sector is likely to increase the investment, which means that uh, uh, investment saving balance of corporate sector would not increase savings. And uh, uh, the same can be said about household sector. Um, because of the higher consumer tax rates, they would be forced to s reduce some saving to sustain the level of spending. And uh, big question would be what will happen to the government balance. But uh, at least this year, at least past half of this year, Japanese government deficit would not improve very much because the uh, government would continue to try to stimulate the economy from fiscal side. So uh, all these three main sectors would not see an improvement in their investment saving balance, uh, at least for the two to three quarters to come. So uh, it is possible for us to, for, for Japan to continue to have current account deficits for some time. But after that, in my view, at least temporarily, we should see a very visible improvement in government investment saving balance as a result of two things. One is, of course, higher consumption tax rate. And the second is a much better tax revenue and while long-term interest rate would be continue to be depressed by the BOJ, this situation would continue at least for two years. So uh, I think uh, 2015, 2016 would be the year when people would be at least temporarily surprised by the improvement in the government balance of Japan. So uh, during the during the uh, process, uh, I think uh, Japan would restore some small current account surplus. Thank you. Um, working press folks first. Uh, ah, I see Daniel over there. 
Oh, so maybe my pointing was uh, not clear, but ne next, next. <laughs> One, two, yeah. <laughs> Daniel Leusink, Head Financiële Dagblad, the financial paper from Holland. Um, I missed the presentation, so my apologies if any of the speakers already touched upon my question. I'll hit you with a gavel if I have. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, one of the first things that government did last year was move the uh, special reconstruction budget to the special accounts. Um, and I'm not an expert on this at all. So what's the role of this special account? And secondly, to what extent do you think that the reconstruction of Tohoku can become a motor for economic growth and for abenomics? Thank you. Anyone want to tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, first point on the special account, I mean, this is a Japanese uh, central government's uh, budget uh, scheme that uh, we, we always focus on the general account. That's for all, or nearly all uh, uh, key, key spending and revenue of the central government. But uh, uh, for the special purposes, uh, government set up the special account. And uh, in 2011, uh, after the, the uh, Tohoku disaster, government uh, sort of decided to separate this account because this special, I mean, this uh, reconstruction of the Tohoku region is a very different uh, idea of, uh, from a central government's general account. So that's more sort of, you know, technical of uh, accounting issues. And uh, last year, uh, government uh, sort of um, it's a little bit tricky, uh, technical issue, so I don't want to dig in too much. But point is, uh, from the macroeconomic perspective, it doesn't matter whether reconstruction is happening in Tohoku or uh, public investment in Tokyo or Okinawa is happening. That's all the same for us, that all public investment increase, that makes the GDP growth higher. And the government is now, uh, of course, trying to uh, reconstruct the Tohoku region as soon as possible. But... Uh, there are many issues uh, related to the uh, uh, consensus view on how people uh, sort of reconstruct the towns and the cities. So the procedures are a little bit delayed, and that makes it very difficult for the government to uh, pursue the uh, reconstruction activity over there. But at the same time, uh, from macroeconomic policy uh, as a fiscal policy, a government need to spur the, uh, I mean, to stimulate the economy. So uh, they are more focusing on the investment, uh, not only the, uh, the Tohoku regions, but also all over the country. And now we are more and more uh, stories hearing about the uh, investment in Tokyo for the uh, preparation of the Olympic Games in 2020. I'm not probably exactly answering your question, but that's what's happening, I think. Anyone have anything to add on Tohoku? Well, um, spending to reconstruct Tohoku is making our work very difficult because uh, the timing of raising money by the government and uh, actually spending is very different. So uh, it's very di it, it's, it is making very difficult for us to estimate the real level of spending by the government. Uh, that is a kind of uh, the one of the reasons why uh, macro researchers' views on the government policies effect are so divided for this year. And uh, my view is that uh, uh, judging from the recent data by the government, uh, spending to reconstruct the, 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 the Tohoku area is being to some extent delayed. So the timing of spending is now pushing forward. I mean, pushing, I'm sorry, delayed to in, mm -hmm. the, in the future point. So uh, I think uh, this year uh, we could see uh, feel some support of the increase in spending in that area because of actually money was raised in the past years, but uh, spending would be made this year. So that would be uh, uh, making the government uh, fiscal policy a little bit more st uh, stimulative uh, to the growth this year. Maybe. Thank you. Uh, Kobo Inamura, associate. Uh, uh, it's not 100% uh, uh, satisfactory, but uh, I, I, I could listen to your opinions that uh, Abenomics was uh, successful. At least uh, the first arrow and the second arrow, which, was, uh, which were against the uh, uh, conventional usual preachings of the economists and somebody else. But uh, 
while listening to your uh, comments about the third law, uh, is it all right to maintain the structural reforms that was uh, usually said that if it lacks, uh, it uh, uh, breaks the economic growth, etc. My impression for the past decades' ex experience is that uh, that economic uh, structural reforms should be uh, discarded. What do you think? That's an interesting question. Uh, of, you, you've all spoken out in favor of structural reforms and, and if anything, critical of the uh, inadequacy of the third arrow so far. But what about this uh, counter-proposition